questions. And I want to let the participants know that we will take questions for about five minutes, then we will do the feedback survey, and then the presenters have agreed to stay on an additional 10 minutes for questions that you may have. So our first question uh, for Joe and Joan is, how do you address teaching vocabulary when students lack background knowledge to understand the concepts? I'll take that one. Yeah, that is, that will be the first question posed to you. Thank you so much. Um, when students lack background knowledge, teachers should take extra care in student-friendly definitions that they provide, as Joe discussed. Using visuals, realia, video clips, graphic organizers, word maps, examples, and non-examples can enhance instruction for these students. In addition, calling attention to the word when the students later encounter it in text they are reading and when they're talking about it will also cement their new learning. So basically use a lot of visuals and body language and anything you can to make the content meaningful to students that have limited English. Thank you. Excellent. And there was another question asked in the chat pod that addressed, uh, it was similar to this question so I'm going to combine them both. How do you address varying levels of English proficiency and, for example, in the video, the, the word pattern for students who are mainstream that may already have, if the L's are a minority in the classroom, students who may already have that vocabulary in their register. Okay. Well, uh, I think if, uh, if you look at the, the practice guide, there are several strategies that are helpful for differentiating instruction. Um, such as uh, rigorous vocabulary instruction, use of graphic organizers, uh, cooperative structures, sentence starters, and writing frameworks. Um, there are numer numerous texts that address uh, how things can be adjusted for students. Unfortunately, we, we cannot uh, recommend any particular commercial products. But also you could look uh, at the What Works Clearinghouse uh, website for additional strategies that work. And, and if you have a, a class uh, of students and uh, most of them do know what pattern means, um, and th then you, would have, you could differentiate instruction by pulling a small group out and giving them this type of explicit instruction that you saw in, in this video. So, um, then the other children wouldn't be bored. Or perhaps while you're teaching them pattern in a small group, the remainder of the class could be filling out um, a word map or a Freyer model or uh, something like that to, so that they can practice while the other students are learning it. Excellent. Good suggestions. Great answer. Um, so another question is, how can vocabulary and instruction Sorry. I'm sorry, did you want to add something, Joe? Yeah, yeah, this is Michael. Is it okay Michael. if I just jump in real quick? Oh, yeah, Well, go just ahead. On, those, on those two points, because I think they're both really, really good questions, and, and I think Joan and Joan uh, give some really nice examples. I, one thing I just wanted to say is I think both of these are, are actually sort of good situations to be in. I think, um, so first on the, the question of background knowledge, I think that often when you're teaching vocabulary where students lack the background knowledge, that's actually exactly the vocabulary you should be teaching. <laughs> because I think vocabulary teaching, you know, there are, there are times when you're just giving students new labels, but there's often times when you want to be building the new concepts. So I think that's not a situation that's sort of just a special case. I think that should be often in vocabulary instruction. You should be working with new concepts for students. Um, and that I think a lot of what Joan said makes a lot of sense for, for making those accessible. I also think that if your vocabulary instruction is embedded in rich content, that content will be building that background knowledge up over time. So the videos and the other work you're going to do is really going to work. Um, the other thing I was going to say about similarly with varying levels of English proficiency, I also think that's a benefit in the classroom. I think that we often, I, I think a traditional approach to ESL instruction um, or instruction for English learners is trying very hard to kind of differentiate always when really sometimes having those heterogeneous groups actually really helps because some students can model for other students rich language, rich ways of using, wor using words. And as Joe said, I think there are ways in which students can enter the instruction at different levels and get different things out of it. So in some of our work with middle school vocabulary intervention, we see that some students are learning some more, they're being exposed to words for the first not time. Other students have a 
vague understanding of a word, but they start to get that deeper understanding. So I think that that um, that we shouldn't we should be we should be careful to avoid spending too much time trying to differentiate everything we do and sometimes provide additional scaffolding that some students will need the extra scaffolding, some students won't, but allowing that um, heterogeneity to actually be a real benefit in the classroom, not necessarily just uh, something you need to deal with or accommodate. Excellent. Thank you, Michael, for adding to that, elaborating more on that. I think that's a, a very rich answer and I agree with, with it. We're going to switch gears uh, just briefly to go to our feedback our survey uh, because we don't we want to have that um, feedback before uh, people start signing off and then we will resume questions so participants please hold on and um, the survey should be on your screen now if you can click on it and take a minute or two to answer the questions and then come back to the presentation. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to do this. And presenters, we will be back with a, a few more questions. Thank you. Okay, for those of you that are staying on, for the presenters, we can, uh, you can um, complete this survey after the presentation. I'm not sure if I gave any of you enough time, but we're going to resume questions now. And so a question that was posed, that were, it was posed in mul multiple forms, but essentially, uh, do you agree with translation for teaching abstract words? And one example that was given by a participant was knowledge Conocimiento. Which one of you would like to address that? Okay. Oh, um, I think it's really good to uh, provide uh, cognates when possible, or just the, the word in Spanish. Um, I, the uh, newcomer teacher that you observed in the video does that all the time because her students are coming. Um, you know, they're brand new immigrants to the United States and they have no knowledge of English, but they do have a strong, most of them, a foundation in Spanish and also an academic foundation. But I would like to say that most of the students that we have in my district that I worked in, Pasadena, do not have a strong background so much in Spanish. So for, for to throw conocimiento in the classroom may not be helpful to um, elementary students that were actually born in the United States and have been in school since kindergarten. That's what teachers tell me and that they just don't know Spanish. So it just really depends on the students you are teaching. If you're teaching students with a background in Spanish, I think it's an excellent tool to use. Thank you. Excellent, Joan, and yes, I agree. Certainly in Texas with 80% of ELs being Spanish speaking, that would be applicable here in some in most contexts. Um, another question that was posed was, uh, how can uh, vocabulary instruction be combined with language instruction? For example, language functions and syntax. Okay, thank you. That's a very good question. It's important that English learners are fluent with all aspects of language, including functions and syntax, in order to use the academic vocabulary words that they are learning appropriately, meaningfully, and confidently when they are reading, talk, during peer conversations, and when writing. Using academic vocabulary within the graphic organizer enables students to familiarize themselves with text structure that go along with that graphic organizer. For example, with compare and contrast, you might words like on one hand, this happens on the other hand, but both you use the text structure features so that they can begin using these structures and familiarize themselves with the, that. And also sentence frames and sentence starters, are, um, which are mentioned in Recommendation 3, give students additional practice with language instruction. Vocabulary sh instruction should not take place in isolation, but it should be incorporated into classroom discussion and writing opportunities that allow language functions and syntax and so on to, to come forth naturally in the conversation. 
Thank you. Excellent, Joan. Thank you for sharing that. Michael and Joe, do you want to add anything to that question, to that answer? Uh, no, I, I thought Joan did a great job. <laughs> I agree, she did. Okay, uh, another question in, that was posed is what is the best approach to vocabulary instruction for long-term long term L? I could jump in on that question. This is Michael here. Um, I think that a lot of the one thing I would point out is that if you if you look at some of the uh, if you look at the practice guide, a lot of the studies that were done in middle school classrooms were with majority long term L's. So, um, in particular, a number of the academic vocabulary studies um, were done with students who would be considered long term L, um, English learners, as well as a number of the content area studies. So, the first two recommendations. Um, and I think, so I think most of the recommendations do apply quite well to long-term English learners. I think some of the differences you might keep in mind would be um, that I think the distinction between academic vocabulary and more basic everyday vocabulary is particularly important for long-term English learners because they often have very well-developed sort of conversational skills, but they may have had very limited um, opportunities to read, limited opportunities to learn the more academic language of print. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, I also think that the fourth recommendation about interventions may be applicable not to all long-term English learners, but certainly to particular long-term English learners who have, had, who have had good opportunities to acquire English and develop English skills, but are still have those sort of persistent difficulties that we might think about some small group work or some small group interventions that are targeted to their particular needs. And I think that means assessing not just, not just saying, well, we know they're a long-term English learner, and we know that they're not passing the English proficiency test in our state, whatever that happens to be. Um, but it means additional diagnostic assessment to find out, well, why are they struggling? Why have they been struggling for several years to acquire English? And in many cases, it seems to be that it's not usually listening and speaking that are difficulties, it's reading and writing. And so then thinking about the interventions that they might need based on their particular skills within reading and writing that they're struggling with. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. And I have another question that's been posed in, in several ways, so I'll try to piece it together for you. One question that was posed in the, in the pod earlier was, how do you teach all the words that the district uh, mandates and still keep it to fewer than 10 words per week? And then the flip side of that is, how can you teach all the words that students need to know, 50,000 by 12th grade, to prepare for the SAT when you only teach fewer than 10 words per week? So whoever wants to take that on, we're ready to listen. That's a tough question. Um, Really, there's no easy answer. The, uh, I feel, and I think the practice guide reflects it, and the research reflects it, is you know, it's better to teach a few words well than to teach you know, 20 words in a very cursory fashion. And, um, and, and probably that's not an answer people want to hear. I think uh, another thing that folks, teachers can do is um, is uh, words in the environment have have children uh, copy down words or remember words um, that they heard during the day or at home or on the television bring them into school uh, teacher elicits them puts them on the board and then takes a, one or two and gives a nice friendly definition and things like that and consistently uses them. Uh, throughout the year and a, a lot of cumulative review uh, of, of those words. Uh, I, I think another thing for, uh, to increase, increase vocabulary, as you know, is wide reading. The people who read more have better vocabularies because um, they, they run into the words and there, there are levels of knowing vocabulary. You may come across the word and you really don't know what it means when you read it in one context, but then you, you come, across, come across it again in another context, and there's maybe more of an explanation. So as you read more, your, uh, your knowledge of that word becomes more sophisticated. So um, it's probably, again, not what you want to hear, but it's a very uh, uh, tough thing to do 
uh, if you read the Hart and Risley studies about uh, trying to catch children up from low SES is very difficult. Do you want to add? I just wanted to add that I think it's kind of counterintuitive with long-term English learners and vocabulary instruction. You think that they need so much catching up that you just have to throw so many words at them, but I really think taking time to teach five to eight words you know, over time intensively is going to benefit them more than anything else. And also research proves that this technique works. So I think, you know, slowing down with the instruction for these students and, and taking time with really important words that are, um, meet the criteria that I discussed earlier would really be beneficial for them. Let me, can I just jump in real quick too? I think that um, I agree with everything Joan said and everything Joe said, and I think it's right that the um, you may want to push back on the recommendation that a district or a school is pushing you to teach a large number of words every week. Um, the other thing I would add is that some words can be taught quite quickly, um, not these kind of core important academic words, but it may be there's some words on those lists that can be taught very quickly, and then you can prioritize your instruction for sort of the other words, right? So you can do this kind of rich discussion, this rich instruction for a small number of words, and have some slightly quicker instruction sort of addresses some of the other words. The other thing I'd add is that word learning strategies, so the task of, I agree that it's this huge task to learn 50,000 words in a deep way before the end of school. I think that a key to that is helping students have that metalinguistic understanding that even though they're learning, you're only teaching them a small number of words deeply, they understand how words relate to each other. They understand morphology and word parts. And so they may learn analyze, but they also know analysis and analyst. And so they're increasing their vocabularies through and broadening that sort of dealing with that much larger challenge of learning lots of words by learning these strategies. Context clues is another strategy, of course, that if they can get good at, they can pick up, they can benefit more from the reading that Joe was talking about in terms of acquiring new words. Excellent answer, and I support all of, the, all of those, uh, all of your answers, actually. The morphology is an important piece. So we're going to have one more question, and then we're going to wrap it up. And this question uh, is important, and particularly in areas where there's dual literacy instruction. How can these strategies be used to develop academic vocabulary in Spanish? My feeling is that you would use the exact same strategies that are presented in the practice guide, but just teach them in Spanish. That's my feeling. But I, I don't think any different should be done because this is instruction that's based on research, and it would work with children no matter if they're learning in English or Spanish or whatever language. You know, there are many dual immersion schools emerging, and um, what ends up happening is that they get stronger in both languages through these dual immersion programs. So I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that. But um, good instruction is going to be good in whichever language. That's my feeling. Also, I want to mention in one of our vocabulary studies, we had uh, teachers that uh, taught uh, Spanish reading. And, and in, in the intervention, the uh, professional development, we taught them student-friendly definitions and examples and non-examples, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they would come back, uh, we, we met like twice a month, and we did a debrief on how, how did the lesson that you planned in this group go? And um, the same strategies were used for both um, English and Spanish, and they were very successful. The kids were learning the words. I suspect you can use these strategies in any language to teach to teach any language. Thank you, and I certainly agree with that. I think that sometimes uh, English um, teachers of English learners focus on one language uh, and at the detriment sometimes of the Spanish. We also need to build the Spanish for English, Spanish, or whatever the second language is. But thank you so much. I think that um, the, it's been very valuable to everybody, all the participants. I want to thank you for staying extra. And I want to thank all, I want to thank first um, Michael Kiefer for your presentation, very informative, and Joe and Joan, yours as well, very informative. And I appreciate that you were answering questions in the chat pod. I think our participants do too. And all the participants, thank you so much for joining us. Please visit our website. Uh, and thank you and have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.
thank you, everyone. this concludes our bridge event webinar.